I'm Joyce Hornady. You might say accuracy is my business. I make bullets. You are listening to the Hornady Podcast. Thanks for joining us and enjoy the show. Welcome back, everybody. Thanks for tuning in on another episode of the Hornady Podcast. I'm your host, Seth Swerzik, as always, and I'm joined today by the great group of guys you've been getting to know on the show, Senior Ballistician Jaden Quinlan and Ballistic Engineering Technician Jacob Morrow. Guys, thanks for coming back on. Absolutely. It's great. So we need to continue our study of all things ballistics. And for the listeners out there uh, that are jumping in on this episode, you're going to want to rewind a little bit because we've done a couple episodes now. Uh, We've covered kind of a brief history, a really, you know, top level view of just the history of the study of ballistics. And then we kind of defined ways that we measure things and the use of a Doppler radar and how that actually works. And then we took a, a really deep dive into a unique topic that not everybody understands very well, and that's internal ballistics. And that was packed with a bunch of good stuff. It was pretty dense. Um, I had to, I listened to that one. I sat here and listened to you guys. And then I listened to it twice after that. And every time I have, I've come away with something that I was like, oh, wow. You know, I either I didn't know that at all or man, I I knew that that's how that worked, but I didn't, you know, I'm not applying that to my functional brain right now. And I'm really excited about this episode because I think this area of of study is got some dogma to it. It's got some things that are assumed are correct. It's got some myths that are, you know, popularly accepted. Um, And it's got just a bunch of cloudy information out there on the internet. And I'm really excited to to get your guys' take on the study of external ballistics. Now, I want our listeners to understand that we're not talking about external ballistics in such that you are using a calculator to, you know, calculate a solution and try to hit a target. What I want to discuss today is the external influences on a bullet. So from it's uncorked from the muzzle and now it's traveling down range up into hitting the target. What are the influences that make that bullet act the way it does and what kind of what things are we fighting Um, so with that i'm going to kick it over to you guys so internal ballistics ended as that bullet started to uncork from the muzzle and now we're at that event where do we start i'd like to caveat this a little bit before we begin with it's really difficult to get into the nuts and bolts of external ballistic principles without without analogies that aren't necessarily 100% true. So we're going to use okay. some analogies in this conversation that aren't 100% exactly what's occurring with the bullet, like functionally, but it will portray, I think, a story that's true enough for people to understand it okay. because it's really complex. You, you, look at, you look at the defining equations of motion around, uh, you know, whatever aspect that we're going to talk about today, drop due to gravity, spin drift, aerodynamic jump, any of those phenomena, um, those equations are very dense and thick. And since we're talking about this mainly in an audio format, you know, a lot of people are just going to listen to this. I think, I think it's important. Those of you that are sitting down with your textbook at hand with the keyboard, you know, yep. uh, you know, trigger at the ready, just understand that some of this conversation is, is going to be done in a way to convey to everybody, not, you know, the nitty gritty exact details of what's going on. Okay. Well, and that's a good point because this is conversational. Mm -hmm. There is no textbook out here. uh, And these are incredibly complex uh, things to talk about. And we want to be as in-depth and descriptive as we possibly can, but you also have to have the majority of people that listen to this able to digest what you said and make sense of it. And I think by Using some some generalities here and there in your examples, I think you'll be able to do that. Historically, Jaden has been the king of making uh, people like me able to understand things that are, you know, a little more complex. So uh, I, I appreci- I'll do my best. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate the caveat there because that is true. This is not a textbook. We're not walking through you know ex- you know very specific formulas. This is a higher level, but also kind of a deep dive into the weeds of of the external ballistics and, you know, in the past we've done the internal and the, the, the history of ballistics and you've done a good job on those. I trust you do a good job on this one as well, but exactly. That's a great point that 
if you're going to sit down and pick through everything with a textbook and a you know fine yeah that's not comb. what this is yeah, exactly this is going to be true enough that you develop a level of understanding that you can apply and it be useful to you mm -hmm. which is missing in the community at large because the defining the the defining uh, you know metrics are so dense that n we haven't really bridged that gap yet between absolute 100% truth which is extremely technical and these phenomena that we observe between those two is a is a true enough to understand the super technical side and mm -hmm. connect the dot with what you're observing. So that yep. would be, I guess, my personal goal in this conversation okay. today. Perfect. Well, and I think you, you, yeah, like you said, there's that huge gap. I think there's a huge gray area where people, long range shooters at large, anybody that shoots stuff, okay, I got a ballistic calculator. I'll grab a BC. I'll plug them in there. Oh, I've heard a spin drift. Okay, the bullet deflects due to the wind and drops due to gravity. Okay, yeah, whatever. There's my solution out of my calculator. I put that on the gun. Didn't quite work. I fudged some numbers here or there, and I get things to shoot well. Uh, and they don't really know what's causing the bullet to do what it's doing. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah. So, appreciate the caveat. Jacob, anything to add about that caveat? No. Uh, I think Jaden usually does a pretty good job of putting things into words to understand. Uh, that's not my best specialty, but... Uh I, I think we can just let them roll with yeah. it. Yeah. Okay. Do you want to? Yeah. So <laughs> Jaden will use words. Jacob will use interpretive dance. Yeah. I'll be uh, doing some hand motions in the uh, back right. to describe it for you. I'll Great. be your your ASL American Sign Language. Uh, Not right. really. I don't know it at all. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Ballistic Sign Language. Yeah. yeah the BSL. All right. <laughs> let's let's get into this, Jaden and, and Jacob. What are, where are we starting at? Okay. Bullet comes out of the muzzle because mm -hmm. last podcast we we came all the way up to that point. I think we dabbled in it a touch, but uh, this one we're going to have to kind of reverse and dabble into interior ballistics a touch at this phase where <clears throat> the bullet comes out of the muzzle. So while the bullet is still in the muzzle, it's obviously held by the barrel, right? Mm -hmm. Around the circumference of the bearing surface, the, the bullet is held in position by the, by the barrel. It's moving down it, being propelled by hot expanding gases behind it. Now, when the bullet comes out of the muzzle, so the back of the bullet has cleared the the front end of the muzzle, the first thing that starts to happen is the gases are escaping now around the bullet because it's not, you know, it's not constrained just behind mm -hmm. the bullet anymore. So step number one here to pay attention to is what is the conditions of the bullet at muzzle exit? Because this is going to start defining what happens as we move downrange. Number one is the conditions of the muzzles. So there's probably a lot of shooters out there that have heard, you know, if you have a ding in your crown or, you know, stuff like that, it can really mess stuff up. Yes and no. Um, extreme examples of it, if you look at some, some muzzle brake designs um, that are very asymmetrical, right? They're, they're fully supported on one side and then there's nothing on the other side. That's going to, to take the gas that comes out of the muzzle and vent it one direction, but not the other, right? It's okay. going to be asymmetric around the bullet. That's going, to, that's going to create turbulence of that gas. So the gas yeah. is going to be turbulent. Okay. So once that, once that bullet, so I, let me back up a little bit back to like the messed up crowned and dinged thing. You know, there is, there is a, there is a theory or a concept that if, if the muzzle is not cut perpendicular to the exit of the bullet, meaning let's say one of the lands or one of the grooves or whatever you want to think of it as, is, is further forward than the rest of them, then as that bullet comes out, that last little land or groove is still in physical contact with the bullet while the rest aren't, and it's rotating. You can It can kind of push itself off of that one last little contact point. Okay. You know, there, there's, there's some information out there about that. Um, pretty hard to see it and measure it type deal. Theoretically, though, or conceptually, you can imagine it probably. Yeah, it's just if you imagine the muzzle being, yeah, not perp perpendicular to the base of the bullet and instead it's at an angle. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. So not only is the bullet supported on one side and not on the other, now the gas is expanding also at an angle. Yeah, so once the bullet does completely come away from contact with, with any portion of the barrel, now the, that gas that is pressurized behind the bullet and was propelling it is going to escape out and around the bullet. And generally that gas is moving at a faster rate than the bullet is. And so what happens is the, the gas quickly like envelops the bullet in like a bubble you could think of it as. And that's a really important point because the bullet, now that it is no longer in contact with the barrel, can move 
in any of six degrees that it that it is that forces are applied to it as. Okay. So one of those degrees um, is obvious. It's it's down right down range. Yeah. Out. Um, yep. Yep. Out or forward, um, and that's because the gas was propelling it that direction. You also have a uh, pitch degree, which is up and down. So you can think of it like pitch is a common term in like flight or mm-hmm. in aircrafts, where that's the the nose position up and down or vertically of the airplane. Uh, same thing with the bullet. You have the yaw direction, which would be left right. Okay. Um, so th- those are three, and then you have uh, roll or spin. The bullet is spinning, and then you have uh, you know you have your forward direction, then you have an up down direction, and you have a left right. So okay. not only do you have up, down, left, right, but you have bullet pointing up or point. and bullet pointing right. That doesn't necessarily okay. mean it's moving left or right or up or down. It's just the way it's pointing. So those are the, okay. the six degrees that a bullet can move in. Okay. Comes out of the muzzle. And depending on the, the essentially the forces applied to it, it's going to move in those six degrees. So it is spinning because the, the rifling and the barrel induced spin onto it. It is moving forward because the, the propellant um, gases propelled it down the barrel and it's moving in, in that vector. Um, so direction and speed. Um, now, when that gas, when that gas bubble comes around the bullet, bullet uncorks, and that gas is moving faster than the bullet, and so it flies out and around the bullet. What can happen is the bullet, now independent of the barrel, free to to move in any of six degrees, can be kicked by those gases. So if you have asymmetric flow, you have more gas flow on one side of the bullet than the other. That can cause the bullet to to go sideways, you could think of it as. Yeah, so that'd be an overstatement, but yeah, it could come off of its perfect yeah, flight path. It induces what's called an angular rate on the bullet. So angle, right? It's flying at an angle now, crooked or sideways, you could yep. think of that as. And and a rate is a is a frequency. It, it has some sort of patterning to it. Okay. Now, an analogy I'm going to start to use, again, that's not technically the same thing of a bullet, but paints a pretty decent picture, in my opinion, is a is a top. A child's top, the yep. toy. Often um, used in, in yeah, describing yeah, things in motion and physics and, and just spin stabilized anything. Yeah, the good thing is that a bullet is a gyroscopically stabilized object and so is a child's top. Now yep. the difference is that a bullet isn't isn't uh, in physically con in physical contact with something the way a child's top is, you know, sitting on the table and spinning. But but some of the principles that you observe in it are are similar enough that you can call it true. Okay. okay. So when you take a child's top and you have it in your fingers, right? And you spin it in your fingers um, and, and you let go. Once you let go of it, the first thing you see that, that top do is kind of like wobble around a little bit at first, right? It goes a little bit crazy before it kind of starts to get nice and stable. Mm-hmm. The bullet does the same thing. And if those, those gases come out asymmetrically, they're going to make that first wobble that you see of the bullet or the child's top much worse. So the okay. angle of it can be higher. And then the frequency of that angle can be higher. So when the bullet comes out of the muzzle, it's really important how that gas flow is managed around the bullet. And that's twofold. One, uh, with, a, with a fixed level of gas flow, a, a fixed load, right, and a fixed barrel length, um, you can have a bare muzzle, you could have a muzzle brake, you could have a suppressor, you could have a flash suppressor. There's all these different devices that we put on muzzles. And they mostly interact with gas in different ways. So if you have asymmetric uh, gas change of directions or, or whatever, robbing the gas off, however it's uh, the device is, is doing it, if it's not symmetrical, you can induce yaw into the bullet. Okay. As soon as you induce yaw into the bullet, you start it going on a certain path that's not the straight path you think. The the problem with it is you don't know which direction it's going because you don't know which direction the bullet was kicked. The direction that the bullet was kicked, let's say from the back end view uh, of the bullet, the the way the gas was dropped off, it took the nose of the bullet and it kicked it to the right at three o'clock. The nose is pointing to three o'clock. That is going to induce a certain direction from your perspective of high, high low, left, right, like on target. Mm-hmm. That's going to induce a certain direction response to the bullet. So it might, if the nose ends up getting pointed to the right at three o'clock due to the muzzle exit gas flow orientation, that bullet, let's say, is going to hit high on target in response to that. So what happens there early matters later. That's yeah. why we're talking and about it. And it gets progressively worse the further it would get away then if it's linear. Yeah, it it's slightly worse than linear, but it's 
close enough for linear you could think of it that way okay. and not be completely wrong. And also a probably a good caveat to everything you've just said so far, when you're talking kicking it and pointing it in a different direction, we're talking tenths of a degree. Oh or yeah, or less than thousands that. or hundreds. Yeah. It okay. can be extremely small. I mean, it can be larger if you get really wild with it. Yeah, things. but for the most part, I mean, <laughs> um, it's not something you're going to you can't shoot on high it. speed camera and see, oh yeah, look how far right. that nose was. It's super minute. It's tiny. Not yeah. something you could measure with your protractor at home. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So what can make that worse is diving back into the last subject a little bit on internal ballistics is cutting barrels back because you're now expo- when that bullet uncorks from the muzzle there's now more pressure there because you're you're early you're the bullet's coming out of the barrel earlier in the internal ballistic cycle and so generally uh, what you see is that as you cut barrels shorter and shorter and shorter your group sizes start to open up and now that's obviously cartridge dependent go back and listen to that other podcast because we went more in the weeds on that mm-hmm. um but that's why you see that is because the more blast there is on the base of the bullet, the more chance you have at kicking the bullet. The more the bullet gets kicked, the worse the the jump or change in direction of the vector that the bullet is on is. So that first part is really important when the bullet first comes out of the muzzle. Okay. Now, some listeners have probably heard of the term a bullet goes to sleep. Yeah. Um, well, it should. Uh, so <laughs> so when the bullet comes out of the muzzle and it's free to move in any of those six degrees because the barrel is no longer holding on to it, it, just like that child's top, when we first drop, let go of it from our fingers spinning and it hits the table and it's kind of wobbling around, when that bullet first comes out, the nose kind of, I don't know if you'd say wakes up, but I guess you would say that in relation to the term goes to sleep. Okay. So the, the nose pattern wakes up and you, you've some listeners may have heard of precession and nutation. That's just a description of that kind of wobble nose pattern that the bullet has. Yeah, like a spirograph. Spirograph, yeah. If you're old enough to play with a spirograph as a kid, kind of that little wobbly um, pattern it makes, the bullet does the same thing. Now, there's something really important that's happening right here that is also misunderstood, and that is uh, this is the start of gyroscopic stability. So gyroscopic stability loosely defined as if the bullet is traveling point first or not, right? So most people think of gyroscopic stability from the standpoint of bullet length, and that's because of some legacy formulas that have been around for a long time used to calculate stability with a lack of information on the bullet. Like Greenhill and the Miller stability formula come to mind, that that was the standard back in the day. Yep, those two specifically. Okay. And, and the Miller is more accurate than the Greenhill. The Greenhill uh, is older. But um, essentially, what those formulas do is they try to calculate the gyroscopic stability of the bullet based on the bullet length and the diameter um, and the twist rate. And that's not how gyroscopic stability works. Those are decent approximations if that's all you know but it's not how it works and i think it would be valuable to explain how it works yeah absolutely um, especially if you can get it on my level of of conversation here yeah. so i can understand it so this one's going to be a, a bit tough so so stick with me here verbally anyway with visual aids that it's much easier okay so you have a bullet and we're looking at the side of the bullet and to the left this is a long range style bullet so to the left is a boat tail in the middle is a bearing surface and to the right is the ogive or the nose right yeah So that bullet, based on its shape that we just talked about and the mass layout within it, what it's made out of, lead, copper, air gaps. Yeah, where the lead is at. Whatever that bullet is made of material-wise, the position of of, of, of those materials within the shape of the bullet and their densities will, will result in a center of gravity position. And that's a fixed location. And again, it's a function of the mass characteristics of the bullet and in the materials it's made up of and its shape okay so if i change the shape of the bullet i can change where the center of gravity is but within a given bullet within a given bullet design they're the same right we we, you know the shape's the same the the materials we use are the same so the center of gravity is essentially a fixed location the next part of stability is the center of pressure the center of pressure is is a little more difficult to understand there's there's three three major components that control the the center of pressure location and they all change all the time so that's what makes it difficult so let's talk about number one so center so you could think of the center of pressure as the point at which the aerodynamic forces are acting on the bullet okay Um, so so the first one shape of the bullet 
If the bullet is more aerodynamic, the center of pressure will move to the rear on the bullet. Okay. It'll move from ogive towards boat tail. If the bullet is less aerodynamic, so let's say a modern, let's say an ELDM versus a round nose. Okay. That round nose shape is way less aerodynamic, and, and the result of that is that the center of pressure location will move forward due to the shape. It moves by three things, so we're talking about them independently here to understand them. So that's what the shape, how the shape influences it. Next is the velocity. The faster the bullet is traveling from a velocity perspective, the further to the rear the center of pressure will move. The third one is air density. The higher the density of the air, the further, see if I'm getting this right, the further forward the center of pressure will move. I'm, I usually do this with a visual, so if, <laughs> if I had that backwards, I apologize. It's inconsequential on the understanding of this, though. So that center of pressure is moving around based on those three different things, uh, two of which are changing all the time. One, your shape is static, right? So the contribution of the center of pressure location due to state, shape is static. Yeah, you're shooting the same bullet. Obviously, it's different for every bullet, but mm -hmm. if you're shooting a 108-grain ELD match bullet, then it's the same. It's the same. But the other two things are highly variable. Um, especially the velocity, because yeah. the velocity is always in a state of change. As soon as your bullet comes out of the muzzle, it starts to slow down, and it continues to slow down until it hits something, right. whether that's the ground or a target or whatever. The air density thing can be viewed as mainly a fixed value within a given shot, right? The air density isn't going to change a whole lot between um, you and 800 yards downrange, <clears throat> unless you're shooting at dramatically steep up or downhill angles, but let's consider flat most fire. of it flat fire. Um, so, so that center of pressure is going to move, right? Because we know that it moves with velocity and we know that our velocity is always changing. Therefore, the center of pressure is going to change. Now, with that kind of understood, you could view, so that if, you, if you, we talked about the center of gravity first, if you, if you pinned the bullet, you drilled a hole through the bullet on the side of it and you pinned it through the center of gravity, it would be able to rotate around that pin, right? That's kind of how to view this, is the bullet, is, those aerodynamic forces are acting through the center of pressure location, but the bullet is pivoting through the center of gravity. Yeah, that's location. like the axle or the, the, the movement point. Yeah, okay. yeah. Um, and so, so the distance, you could, so that's your pivot point of center of gravity. The distance between the center of gravity and the center of pressure is like a pry bar. So think about you're trying to lift something heavy and you're using a fulcrum and a pry bar yep. uh, type, type situation. That's how we're going to talk about this. So the distance between center of gravity and center of pressure is the pry bar. The force is acting to overturn the bullet because the bullet wants to fly with the center of pressure behind the center of gravity. Um, that's why we have to spin them. If you don't spin a bullet fast enough and it's unstable, what happens is the bullet will will get to a position where the center of pressure is behind the center of gravity because that's where it's in its yeah. happy place with it's, no spin. Yeah, tumbling. So the 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 center so the the thing trying to tip the bullet over is that oncoming airflow. So if you reverse think about it, instead of the bullet moving, you just think about 3000 foot per second air moving over the top of the bullet. That's essentially the equivalent of what's actually happening when you shoot. Okay. It's just that the air is static and the bullet is moving. In that example, bullet static air is moving. Same dynamic, just in reverse. Okay. That air, that air is trying to tip the bullet over, and it's pushing on the center of pressure location, and it's pivoting around the center of gravity location. So the distance between those two points is your pry bar. The strength of the arm that's pushing on the end of the pry bar is that airflow, or oh, okay. that air density, sure. right? And those two in combination. So when a bullet first comes out of the muzzle... The center of pressure is as far back as it's ever going to get because the velocity is as high as it's going to get. So if we consider the air density fixed and we consider the center of pressure location due to shape fixed, which it is, the only variable left is velocity that causes center of pressure to change. The center, so the center of pressure is as far to the rear as it's ever going to get because the bullet is going as, as fast as it's ever going to go when it first comes out of the muzzle. What that means is that the pry bar is the shortest it will ever be. Well, a shorter pry bar has less leverage than a longer pry bar, yeah, right? Yeah, that stands to reason. The problem is that the strength at the end 
the strength of the arm pushing on the end of that pry bar when it comes out of the muzzle is extremely strong. Way stronger than any leverage gain we're going to get later. So that means that the bullet is the most unstable gyroscopically when it comes out of the muzzle. As it continues downrange and velocity is lost, that center of pressure location starts to move forward, away from the center of gravity. And that causes the pry bar to get longer. Should have more leverage, right? Right. You do. The problem is, is that the strength of the arm pushing on the end of the pry bar is the velocity. So it gets weaker. So the velocity gets, the strength of the arm, velocity, gets weaker at a faster rate than the gain in leverage of the center of pressure moving away from center of gravity causing the pry bar to get longer. Okay. So gyroscopically, a bullet is most unstable when it comes out of the muzzle, and it gets more gyroscopically stable as it goes downrange. Key word being gyroscopically, because there's technically two types of stability. We haven't got to, dyna to dynamic stability yet, but we, we might in this one. So that's important to understand because most users are familiar somewhat with the bullet length thing. Mm -hmm. Well, bullet length doesn't Define tell you anything. anything about this story I just told you that's dependent on shape, mass layout, air density, velocity. Yeah, because right? that center of gravity is dependent on the mass distribution of the bullet. It could be, yeah, two inches long, but if all the mass is in the rear versus a two-inch long bullet that has even mass distribution or lead throughout the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Same shape, same length, incredibly different centers of gravity. Yeah. And the stability equation is even more complex than that analogy I just gave you with the pry bar and all that because it includes the inertial the, in, the inertial characteristics of the projectile as well as some of the aerodynamic characteristics like uh, the, the pitching moment um, coefficient. So it's way more complex. Now that's... Yeah. That, so that's why I'm saying, like, I'm using analogies that are not 100% accurate, but they're true enough yeah. that you might be able to grasp onto yep. it and use it, you know? Yep, that um, was really in-depth, and I think as far as, as in-depth goes, that's as deep as we need to go. Okay. Any, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we probably have to have visuals if we want to go farther than that. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. and again, if, I, if that last part of the center pressure, uh, if, if I messed that up, I, I apologize. I... I Put out the right info there, but it's been long enough that I've given that in only a verbal yeah. format well, that I like might have missed it. Conceptually, though, the relationship doesn't necessarily matter. The fact is that you have you understand that there is a relationship. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's gyroscopic stability, and that that right there probably blew some minds, just because so many people are used to putting in caliber, bullet length, twist rate, go. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, it's perfectly stable. That'll be fine. Mm -hmm. and, and not not always the case. And the reason that I went down that little rabbit hole for a second is because I said that we talked about the gas flow stuff and the ability to kick a bullet or whatever. Um, this also comes from uh, any tilting of the bullet in bore, right? We talked about that a little on the last podcast, that a bullet can gr engrave crooked into the rifling mm -hmm. and that it will come out crooked. Um, that is important because a bullet that comes out crooked is is having the same effect to it as a bullet that gets kicked by the asymmetric yeah. gas. Any Any crookedness that the bullet encounters when it comes out of the muzzle is going to result in a jump in a certain direction. The reason that that is so important at the muzzle is because the bullet is at its most gyroscopic unstable point. So it's it's the most susceptible to that stuff occurring and having a having a the, the biggest effect on the bullet. So as the bullet gets more gyroscopically stable those those things can be lessened in their severity i guess you could say okay now that's a cat there's a caveat there too so everybody don't run out and get super fast twist barrels because your gyroscopic stability is higher and Jaden says that fixes all these problems he's yeah. described because at the same time there's trade-offs to going to a faster twist barrel that we haven't got to yet all righty but bullet comes out of the muzzle uh, it's got all those gases flowing it can get kicked bullet can also come out of the muzzle crooked either one of those circumstances will cause the bullet to jump in a certain direction it's incredibly sensitive to that at that point because the gyroscopic stability of the bullet is at its lowest point when it comes out of the muzzle now this gets into the bullet going to sleep thing so the the fact that it has that nose that that yaw cycle or, or precession or nutation, whatever terms you want to use to talk about that, because the bullet nose is awake, um, if a bullet is dynamically stable, not gyroscopically that we just talked about, but dynamically, 
that angle of attack or yaw pattern that it has will damp itself out. It will get smaller. Like, so, a, like a top. Like a top. Exactly like a top. So you spin it and it's kind of goofy and wobbly at first. And then after a second or two, it kind of just really stabilizes. And it's like just sitting there vertically, right? Yep. That's a perfect example. That top went to sleep. The bullet goes to sleep too if it's dynamically stable. Okay. There are dynamically unstable bullets. They're very rare in the commercial market. Um, because we designed Design that out, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> That's undesirable. You don't want that. <laughs> a dynamically unstable bullet will not shoot very good for you. Okay. Um, so that's that's pretty well fixed by us before it gets to you. Um, now dynamic stability rears its head again later in this uh, conversation as we get further and further downrange. But at least initially here, <clears throat> that's what's going on. So when we talk about short range groups on target so we're shooting a group on a target at 100 yards or so um, and you see that all of your bullets don't go into the same hole right now in there <laughs> <clears throat> unfortunately yeah. now it's not there there's velocity variation right velocity variations occurring i think we talked about that a little bit on the last podcast but the velocity variation is not enough to cause the the vertical you see at 100 you know the 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 amount of time that it's taken the bullet to traverse that first 100 yards let's say it's around a tenth of a second that's not enough time for the fast shot and the slow shot to be the high shot and the low shot on target so there's something else that's driving why all your bullets don't go on the same hole some of it's you the shooter but we also have you know here here at hornady we have a a test fixture that you used to run that lab, Jacob, yep. of, of the, maybe just describe that real quick on how it removes the human error. So the test fixture we've got, it's a v bock on, uh, on two rails with a piston that resets it. So every time the gun recoils, it gets set back to the exact same position. And that v block we take a, a barreled action. We've got a whole bunch of different ones. Not so important. Uh, it's got an inch 250 barrel straight contour. And that barrel will sit into this V-block and get clamped down. So there's no human error. We've got a pneumatic trigger. So uh, you'll leave the, the test bay, essentially, close the door, turn a key. That pushes the trigger for you. So there's absolutely no human input into the aiming of the device. And it, the return to battery is just with yep, that rail it's, system. It's straight back, and then it's got two little rubber bumpers that it hits on the way forward, and it goes back to the exact same position. Yep, and that's huge in consistency and everything's tested the same way yep. and it's yeah the return to battery and the firing sequence everything is the same every single time yep so my question to you would be when testing bullets down there do they all go in the exact same hole being that human error is removed and the return to battery is as exact as can be machined oh absolutely not there's there's a lot of it that goes into the construction of the bullet which i think where Jaden is going with it uh, so there's concentricity of the jacket and that'll play a huge role into it. And when I say that we're talking tenths of a thousandths. So, you know, stuff you can't measure without specialized equipment. Uh, and what that does. So if your jacket isn't perfectly there, if the thickness of your jacket isn't perfectly the same all the way around, you're going to shift that lead core to one side or the other. So your center of gravity in a perfect world will go directly down. So I get, let me paint the picture for the viewer. Sorry. Uh, if you're slice a bullet in half hot dog ways, so yeah, you can look down ways. at it yep. and it looks like a circle. So that jacket is going to be a ring around the circle and your center of gravity should go directly down the center of the bullet from that aspect. Well, if you shift that lead core off to the side, cause your jacket thickness is different, your center of gravity is not going to be in the center of form. Okay. So, and that plays a huge role in accuracy because as the bullet uncorks, if it's, you know, it's being constrained by the barrel. Once it's not constrained by the barrel anymore, it's going to want to go rotate around the center of gravity, not the center of form. So that can kick the bullet off and create dispersion, dispersion. at short ranges. Okay. Yeah. So the fact that they don't all go in the same hole, why is that? And Jacob just described one reason why, and that's the center of gravity um, offset problem yeah. from from the and the not to be confused cheaper. with the center of gravity that we were just talking about as far as its hinge point this is the center of gravity going lengthwise through the bullet like an imaginary line 
through the length of the bullet. Yeah, we, yeah. We, the center of gravity location we were just talking about was looking at the bullet from the side. Where is the center of gravity going to be front to back? Yeah, like if you tried yep. to balance it on the tip of your finger. What Jacob's talking about is looking at a bullet from the back end of it. And where is the center of gravity left, right, up, down? Is it perfectly aligned with the center of the bullet yep. looking at the back of it? Or is it off a little bit? Okay. So, so you, you could view that problem, the center of gravity uh, being offset from the center line or center of form of the bullet as an out-of-balance tire. Okay. Uh, yep. Very similar um, behavior. So with when, when you have a tire that's out of balance, what happens when you spin that tire faster? You drive your car faster yeah boom, 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 boom. the yeah. wobble gets worse yep. right so a lot of times you have an out of balance uh tire and you can't feel it when you're just driving in town you know 20 30 mile an hour through residential stuff but you get out on a highway and you're like oh this thing feels like you're it's gonna, gonna come apart yeah you know? shake off the road the bullet experiences the same thing so when i said earlier that spinning a bullet faster increasing the gyro can help with some of those early dynamics in the in the yaw it gets when it first comes out of the muzzle, it can also make it a whole lot worse if your problem comes from a center of gravity offset. The faster you spin that bullet, the worse the wobble gets. The worse the wobble gets, the 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 more dramatic the vector changes are in where the bullet's going to go. Oh yeah, so there's definitely a trade off there. Uh huh. So the reason that those bullets don't go in the same hole at 100 yards is because they engraved a little bit crooked into the rifling and they come out a little bit crooked which causes them to kind of wobble and go in a certain direction depending on the orientation of the wobble when they came out it can come from if there's any center of gravity offset or imbalance in the bullet itself or it can be kicked by the muzzle exit condition due to those gases escaping around so that's kind of this first this first picture of the trajectory is that wobbling of the bullet is going to cause it to randomly go on certain little side directions. And when you shoot a group at 100 yards, that's what you're observing. That highest round of your group, the one up at 12 o'clock, for whatever the reason was, uh, that bullet either had a little bit of center gravity offset, it was either a little bit crooked in bore, or it got kicked by the, the muzzle exit condition in a way that it caused it to be the highest round in the group, and vice versa with all those around. And what you see is, if you shoot a high enough sample size group, it ends up as almost like a perfect circle. Mm -hmm. Now you're if shooting you, 30, 40, 50 shots. Right. Yep. And, and what that is, is a random, it's a random number generator. You, you <laughs> don't know what the error is that you're going to get. This one, this shot, this particular shot has a center of gravity that's off by, um, you know, uh, a tenth of a human hair in this direction, and it engraved into the rifling pointed down at six o'clock, which, as you spin it down the barrel, has it coming out with its nose pointed at nine o'clock. And the muzzle exit condition had more gas on the bottom of the bullet than the top of the bullet, so its nose comes out pointed at nine o'clock, and it gets the back end of the bullet gets kicked up a little bit to 12 o'clock. And the response to that is that that's the highest round in the group. Well, when you randomize that a bunch, this time the bullet's pointed at six and it gets hit this way. It just gets hit all in, yeah. in each of those three totally different circumstances. Random. It's just randomized. That's what creates the round group. Okay. I, I think the, the key there to hold on to is none of these things are affected by the shooter in any way. Yeah. These are predetermined right. things that happen either b before the muzzle or the bullet exited the muzzle because the way the bullet is shaped or just how it, how, the like, how it entered the rifling. Things totally out of your control. Yeah. There is some that's in your control, so in how you load it. Yeah. So there's, you know, uh, uh, load methodologies, there's a bunch of them out there, and they all know that they're right. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> they, they get to the same conclusion, though, which is a better better group than a worse group, right? So yep. uh, that that's a little bit hard to believe that all these different ways to do something reach the same conclusion. Hmm. Anyway. Um, <laughs> we can dive into that later. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's a different podcast. Yeah. But the point of it is that there is some efficacy to those um, techniques with certain conditions. So maybe if you're playing with your jump to the rifling, what you're doing is playing with the bounce pattern of the bullet as it comes out of the case neck and bounces through the free bore and then is constrained by the rifling. Maybe you, maybe in doing that, you figure out a way that the bullet consistently engraves with the nose pointed down at six o'clock and so it comes out with the same orientation. Yeah. Right. That 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 is kind of what you're doing with load development if it is done on a large enough sample size that it's statistically valid. Okay? Yeah. Which almost nobody's doing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, again, <laughs> another different podcast. Another podcast. Yeah. <laughs> the 
the point there though is that that's what you're seeing when you shoot the group at 100 and the, and the bullets don't all go into the same hole um so that's the early flight that's that uh that's that part i think we've covered that well enough so yeah. now we can maybe stretch into what's occurring in like mid mid flight stuff well no we didn't we didn't hit initialization jump or yeah. aerodynamic jump. I was jump about to bring that up because I know that happens right there, and I know that's been clouded with nobody quite understands it. Uh, you know, I put it in the Kestrel, it says aerodynamic jump, okay, whatever. But that's not something that is just uh, a, a quick formula to put on every bullet. That is very specific to each unique bullet and something that I don't think very many people understand. Yeah. So aerodynamic jump or initialization jump, uh, but that is... Yeah, that's something that we need to dive into if we can. Okay. Again, I'm going to use another analogy that that uh, is true enough. Um, okay, so with a, with a gyroscopically stabilized object, when you apply a force to that, the gyroscope responds to that force 90 degrees upstream of the direction of rotation. So if we go back to the child's top. Yep. Spin it on the table. Spin the child's top, and it's sitting there, and it's got past it. The child's top has gone to sleep, and it's got a nice little tight spiral going on, and it's very stable and upright, and it's it's kind of doing like a little a little nose pattern. You'll see that top is you know it's just very small. It's just kind of wobbling around, very small. Bullets doing the same thing. Even after the bullet's gone to sleep, it's still wobbling a very small bit, imperceptible. You can't can't see it or really even measure it. If you if you take and you blow with your breath on the side of that child's top, the top will move away from you because it has enough surface area and you're blowing with enough force that it does physically push it away from you. We're going to get to that in wind deflection. That's not what happens with wind deflection of a bullet. But the child's top does move away from you. Again, it has enough surface area and you're blowing hard enough to cause it to push away from you. At the same time, if you watch that top, it will respond by moving to the right. Okay, because if you're spinning, because if you, if you spin it to the right, yeah, you spin yeah. it clockwise from your perspective it, in orientation to the top. You spin it clockwise, and you blow on it. It will move away, and it will move to the right. Okay, that moving to the right is its response. Because think about it for a second. The top is spinning here in front of me, and I blow on it at this point. I'm applying a force here with my breath. A gyroscope responds 90 degrees upstream of the direction of rotation. Direction of rotation is here clockwise. So if I blow on the clock at 6 o'clock, yep. the response is going to be upstream of that. That's going to be 90 degrees is 3 o'clock. So the response from my, <clears throat> from my perception of this top spinning in front of me right now is to the right. Okay. This is the same thing that happens with muzzle jump, aerodynamic jump, initialization jump. Those three terms are kind of used um, equally in the field, I guess. Uh, so the, you have a cro you're firing into a crosswind. The wind from, we're laying behind the rifle, the wind is coming from right to left. When that wind hits the bullet, the response of the gyroscope is 90 degrees upstream of the, of the force applied. So in a right hand twist barrel, that would be the 12 o'clock or the top of the bullet is the direction it's going to respond in, right? Okay. What that causes the nose to do is point up. Now, it's not just pointing up and staying up. That wobble pattern is still there. And so yeah. what's actually happening is the bullet is spending more time above center. The nose is in, in the wobble. The, the bullet's wobble is spending more time above center than it is below center. And what that does is causes a jump in the vertical direction. In this case, a jump high. That's why when you're shooting into a crosswind and you have a right to left crosswind with a right hand twist barrel, you generally will hit high on target if you don't account for it. Okay. Now, the opposite is true if the wind comes from left to right. The same principles apply. If the wind comes left to right, we're now hitting, <clears throat> we're using a clock again in, in view of the back end of the bullet. The wind is hitting the bullet at the 9 o'clock position. Upstream of rotation would be 6 o'clock, right? So the nose responds by going down. And now but it's again, spinning. it's not just that the nose goes down and just stays that way. The bullet still has that nose pattern that it's tracing out, so it spends more time below center line than it does above center line. So your impacts will be low on target. Mm -hmm. Wow. And then that works basically as a clock. So if you have 12 o'clock, uh, anything to the right of 12 o'clock, you're going to get a vertical jump. 
uh, going upward, and if it's left of 12 o'clock hitting the bullet on the left side, if it's spinning to the right, it'll force the nose down. Yeah. And then it'll change based on the degree in which it hits it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Now, the bullet is most sensitive to, you know, there's some key words in those terms that are used, muzzle jump, initialization, initial yep. jump, right? Um, and then aerodynamic jumps just kind of like a catch all, right? Yeah. But there, there's some importance there in those two first terms, muzzle jump and an initialization jump or initial jump, in that it's happening early, right? That kind of denotes there's something going on at the muzzle or initially that's mm-hmm. causing this to happen. The bullet is most sensitive to that jump at the muzzle, back to our gyroscopic stability conversation, because the bullet is the most gyroscopically unstable at that point. Okay. The gyroscopic moment of the bullet is what's responding, we just described through that, you know, 90 degrees upstream whole conversation we just had, to that. So that said, the gyroscopic stability factor, heavily influenced by the twist rate of the bullet, or, yeah, or the twist rate of the barrel, and therefore the spin on the bullet can influence the amount of aerodynamic jump you have. Mind-blowing. And then that gyroscopic stability dependent on bullet shape, mass distribution. Mm, yeah. And so, yeah, so aerodynamic the, the, jump is not the same for every bullet, no, even if no, the same wind definitely condition. not. No, the, the jump equation is wor- way worse than the stability equation. I mean, stability <laughs> equations in the jump equation plus a whole bunch of other things um so you can't just take a lumped together formula for aerodynamic jump that you measured and then just apply that formula to any other solution you have because it won't be correct right so you know we'll have later podcasts about ballistic solvers and how they work and what they do but this is one of the downfalls that you see in bc based ballistic solvers is they if they do have aerodynamic jump outputs or stability outputs uh they they are assumptions Okay. Because you can't execute those equations of motion without all those known things about the bullet. And so when you get those, likely I would expect some error because those numbers are not being generated based on the execution of the equations of motion that actually dictate that. They're being executed based on generalized formulas like the Green Hill or the Miller stability formula, mm-hmm. which are taking into account generalities about your bullet, but not the specifics that actually dictate how it works you okay know? and we can get in the weeds on that yeah on we those will other eventually podcasts, but. i think one thing important to note is you're going to experience uh, that initialization jump excuse me whether or not that wind is a crosswind or not if it's a true headwind or a true tailwind you're still going to experience that well not necessarily not not the muzzle jump portion what you you, what you experience there is something different. Okay. Um, and I want to get to that, but right before I do, I think I need to, to talk about what happens to the nose of the bullet when a wind, when a crosswind hits it. Yeah, let's get into the that. The bullet gets really, really unhappy. <laughs> it does not like that at all. Okay. Right? So if the bullet's coming out um, and it has those initial, you know, high, high levels of yaw in relation to it going to sleep, not high levels as in like 10 degrees and you can see it. When the, when the crosswind hits the bullet, the nose pattern wakes up and it wakes up like exponentially based on the wind speed. So let's say that in a no wind condition, when the bullet comes out of the muzzle, its initial yaw cycle is 0.03 degrees, a tiny little number. Yeah, I'm just going to throw something out there. Let's say now that same bullet gets shot into a five mile an hour crosswind. That 0.03 degree little yaw nose patterning that it had with no wind now is going to approach a half a degree. That's a lot. That you went from huge 0.03 to 0.5. That's yeah. a huge jump, right? And then let's say that it's actually a 10 mile an hour now. It might go up to like 1.2 or 1.5 degrees. Wow. So that nose pattern really, really wakes up when okay. it gets hit by a crosswind. And that's, that's the other reason that you, that you can actually observe on target the phenomena of aerodynamic jump is because those crosswinds wake the bullet up so much that it actually will jump enough that you can see it on target. That's remarkable. And you can see that at ranges as close as 100 yards. Yes. It, that's essentially a linear, it's a vector change, so it's linear. So okay. that would mean that if you're used to shooting in... Uh, minute of angle or milliradian MRAD, those are both angular units. 
um, you'll generally see that your aerodynamic jump values for a fixed crosswind value are the same. Now that the absolute value of them changes because with you know a, a tenth of a mil at a hundred yards is 0.36 inches, but at a thousand yards it's 3.6 inches. Well, that's a lot more than 0.36, but it's linear. Angularly, yeah. it's the same. Okay. Um, so yeah, that was important that the bullet really he really gets angry when he gets hit by a crosswind. Okay. Um, so I forget what you had asked. So before I, I went for a head and tailwind, you still see a vertical component. Be saying that's not ah uh, yes jump. yes. So the head or the tailwind is more of a you could view it as a as a drag component. So so if the bullet's traveling forward at three thousand feet per second, and you have a ten mile an hour tailwind, the ten mile an hour wind is coming behind the bullet. That's I think fourteen point seven feet per second. So let's make the units the same so that it makes sense. You could essentially take that 3,000 foot per second forward velocity the bullet has and subtract out the tailwind velocity of 14.7 feet per second, and you get, what, you know, 2,986 yeah. feet per second? Yeah. Well, bullet drag is, uh, the overall drag is, is highly tied to the velocity it's traveling at, because in the, in the drag equation, the velocity gets squared. So, so it's huge. velocity times velocity. Yep. So, um. So when you have that tailwind, you're effectively reducing the relative velocity of the bullet. And when okay. you have a headwind, you're increasing the relative velocity of the bullet. Well, any increase or decrease of velocity, relative or not, is squared, and so that plays into drag, right? So it's either increasing or decreasing the drag. Yeah, so if you take, you know, if it was the headwind, it would be 3,014 feet per second. We'll take 3,014 and square it, and then take... 2,986 and square those two and look at the difference in those two calculated numbers, they're, they're pretty big when you start squaring things. Yeah, yeah. So, especially things like velocity when you're in knocking on 3,000 feet per second. Yeah, yeah. so the, the aerodynamic jump isn't, isn't occurring on a, on a directly head or tailwind. But, I mean, how, but they're, how rare is that? Yeah, you know, I was going to say I mean, they're working if together. One, one degree either, either way, you're starting to induce yeah. that, that jump component but so they they work together i'm guessing because if you're not at exactly a tailwind you're one degree off you're mm -hmm. getting some component of a crosswind mm -hmm. and some component of a essentially a decrease in drag because of the velocity yes absolutely so and, and anything besides those cardinal direction inputs are doing that so yep. a crosswind at 90 degrees directly from right to left once it goes to 91 degrees you, there's a tailwind component to that. Oh wow! And so all the way, gets... all the way down to 179 degrees. The only ones where it's gone, where aerodynamic jump is completely gone, is a 180 degree direct tailwind and a zero degree direct headwind. Wow! And that gets incredibly complex. That is absolutely bonkers. Yeah. Uh, that's a lot going on, and I can't wait to get down the road and talk about ballistic solvers and to dive into how, you know. Uh, just our Ford off and in our biased opinion and how Ford off, uh, helps shooters immensely because it's taking those into account versus traditional BC based calculators that just don't have a chance. Mm. That's awesome. So that was kind of the initial areas of flight. And I think you wanted to shift gears into kind of that middle distance after this. Yeah. So the next thing that you, I mean, drop due to gravity is, that's pretty simple. I don't think we need to go into that, but I mean, essentially the bullet is in a constant rate of slowing down. Um, and so what that means is that if we look at it from a range block perspective, let's look at it from 0 to 100 yards compared to 500 to 600 yards. The distance is the same in both of those examples. Well, when the bullet comes out of the muzzle at 3,000 feet per second, <clears throat> it's going to traverse those first 100 yards in, let's say, a tenth of a second just to throw a number out. But as the bullet continues to slow down, when it hits that 500-yard line, it's now going 2,000 feet per second. That's a whole lot slower. So it's going to take it longer to go from 500 to 600 yards than a tenth of a second. It might be a tenth and a half. Mm -hmm. So the fact that it spends more time over the same distance means that gravity has more time to act on it, and th it's going to drop more from your perspective of the line of sight. Okay. So, I mean, the gravity thing's pretty simple. But that leads into spin drift, which is another phenomenon that people observe. Um, and again true enough in this analogy uh of how of how spin drift works it ties back into that conversation we had on on the 90 degrees upstream uh, aspect of a gyroscope's response so 
because the bullet is falling due to due to due to gravity acting on it and the fact that it's slowing down more and more and more and more and more it's falling at a faster and faster and faster rate as time goes on okay so that's why you hear a parabola as the term used to describe yeah, the trajectory it's kind of straight yep. early on and then it starts to drop faster and faster and faster right yep as the bullet starts to drop it is falling down through the air and so you technically have slightly more air pressure on the bottom of the bullet than you do the top because it's falling down through it. Fair enough. Yep. So again, if we apply a force to a gyroscope, it responds 90 degrees upstream of the direction of rotation. Well, if we're applying more pressure on the bottom of the bullet, this can also be um, tied into the, the boundary layer air that's coming around and kind of crashing into that. Some more advanced listeners may have seen that, but we'll leave it as there's more pressure on the bottom than the top, regardless of the reasoning. The response to the gyroscope is 90 degrees upstream of the direction of rotation. So if force is at 6 o'clock, 90 degrees upstream would be 3 o'clock for a right-hand spinning bullet. Mm -hmm. So the response of the bullet is to point its nose slightly to the right due to that. Now you have essentially a drag differential because the bullet's flying slightly crooked. Right, The, the left side of the bullet is presented to the oncoming airflow on the, the vector that it's traveling on, the yep. path the flight path it's traveling on more so than the right side because the nose and again the nose just doesn't go right and stays right it's still, still doing wobbling. that pattern and yep. it stays more right than it does to the left is what's ha is what's happening and so what that does is causes uh, causes the bullet to drift that so, that is a really good example a really well spoken at least for me i conceptualize that really well hopefully our listeners did too yeah, that the, and the the site has presented itself more to the oncoming airflow. And it's also, the, the drop portion of it is that the, the bullet isn't perfectly nosing over and following the, the trajectory path as it really starts to arc down. I mean, it nearly is. It's very, very, very small angles that it's not, but it's nosed up orientation ever so slightly um, causes that pressure on the bottom more than the top as well. Mm. So that's why you see you don't see spin drift early on because spin drift is tied to bullet drop. Okay. So as the bullet starts to drop more and more and more aggressively, the nose angle points more and more to the right. This is referred to as the yaw of repose. Okay. Uh, and that's what causes the spin drift to become observable from a point of impact standpoint at longer distances downrange. The further out you go, the worse the spin drift gets. That's right. why it's it's tied to that. And if you know, you can account for it. And it's kind of a non-issue, you know, if you, if you have a good solver, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. You have to, to actually, to accurately account for spin drift, you have to, you have to have the gyroscopic stability equation in there and you, that's you don't have that with just bullet length no, based on that you, conversation you need, earlier. You need an accurate physical model of the exact bullet you're shooting with yeah. its mass distribution properties and its shape yeah. to get an actual spin drift number that's solid. Mm -hmm. Excellent. That was, that was, yeah, that, yeah. I'm, I'm at a loss for words just trying to digest the last 40 minutes of our conversation, <laughs> but that was really well spoken. So there's a little bit more if you want to keep going. We sure can. Okay. There's a, a misconception out there about, in my opinion, uh, about transonic instability. So many of the shooters that shoot long range have probably heard of this. And generally what it is, so transonic would be described as the low supersonic range of the bullet's flight before it goes subsonic so again the bullet's slowing down the whole time <clears throat> when it comes out of the muzzle it's it's going multiple speeds of sound okay so at, at three thousand feet per second it's going <coughs> excuse me conditions dependent it's going nearly three times the speed of sound or, yeah. or near that you know as it slows down it's going less speeds of sound right yeah <laughs> so your speed of sound is tied to velocity and and temperature mainly uh, Reynolds number technically but as it's a, as it's approaching the speed of sound that kind of range call it Mach 1.2 down to Mach 1 um, would be a generally good window of, of what's considered transonic and it's called transonic because there's a lot of transitions occurring in the drag of the bullet due to its shape at that point there's a lot of changes in the shock wave formations or magnitude or however you want to think about it of the bullet at that point in its flight a lot of changes trans transitions okay so so a lot of things are going on to the bullet there and a lot of people 
historically have perceived that as like a problem area for the bullet from like a prediction standpoint or, or a bullet staying true on its flight path or whatever, whatever it may be. Uh, in what I've observed with a lot of shots on the radar and a lot of, um, a lot of time shooting bullets well into transonic or past transonic is it's not nearly as common as people think. So what can happen in transonic and the reason that this conversation still exists in the community is that a bullet can get dynamically unstable in the transonic region under certain circumstances. And so back to what I kind of defined early as dynamic instability or stability. Dynamic stability would be any yawing pattern or angle uh, of attack pattern that the bullet has is getting is is staying the same or getting smaller. The bullet's going to sleep mm -hmm. or it's staying the same level of awake. Okay. That would be dynamically stable. A bullet that is waking up, the nose pattern is getting bigger and bigger and bigger is dynamically unstable. So what can happen is is in that transonic range, certain certain bullets um based on their shape and their mass and their inertial and their aerodynamic properties can start to wake up and and their nose pattern can start to increase and if that happens from a consistency standpoint you can start to get what's observed as flyers so maybe some of the old 308 shooters shooting like a 12 twist 308 with a mid weight 30 caliber match bullet may have observed that at certain distances yeah say 800 yards with say, that particular load say that yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh, so what happens there is you're shooting out at you know 500 600 700 everything's pretty good you get out to 800 and stuff gets erratic sometimes you hit the target sometimes you don't and when you don't it's erratic as far as where you missed you missed low you missed high you missed left you missed right you know just kind of random that would be a bullet that has dynamic instability or has trouble in the transonic that would be what you would observe from that but you can also see that on the radar when you when you shoot a bullet because any angle of attack that the bullet is flying at increases its drag okay and the radar is a measurement is measuring the bullet's drag right it's measuring the velocity of the bullet well if one bullet slows down faster than the other bullet and they're both the same bullet in the same environment at the same speeds <clears throat> that other bullet had more drag and if it can't, if the shape of the bullet didn't change, the drag due to the shape of the bullet wasn't a contribution to that, then something else occurred. And generally what that is, is the bullet's flying at a higher angle of attack, more drag. So you can see it on the radar. And, and I don't know, I don't know, 20 plus thousand shots on the radar. Prob That's a few. Probably a seen transonic instability with modern bullet designs less than one percent of the time wow but it's still that conversation is still out there right people still talk yeah. about it oh they and mainly they blame it yeah. for why they didn't hit the target yeah. and what this seems to be is that the old legacy solvers the bc solvers have some problems with them which we'll get into when we do that conversation but essentially the problems that those solvers have which happen early in the bullet's flight, show their effect in transonic. Mm. So mostly what's occurring is, because have you ever shot a 6.5 Creedmoor to a mile? Yep. Yep, I have too. Have you ever shot a 308 to 12, 1300? I hit 1200 yards at the Vortex Extreme with it. Well, how, <laughs> how did you do that? Because that bullet was definitely into transonic flight. It should have gone bananas. That You had no chance, right? I didn't have a chance. I don't know what happened. It was, <laughs> 170, uh, it was 178 BTHP. The point is, though, that listeners think about the, the shooting you've done or the shooting that you're aware of that's been done where bullets are well into transonic or oh, beyond, yeah. Yeah, subsonic, and you're still sure. getting consistent hits on target. So there isn't like a, a bunch of gremlins waiting for your bullet to go transonic and then they attack and everything and the wheels fall off, you mm -hmm. know? What I think it is, is that the use of those legacy solvers that have the problems that they have, which present themselves as transonic range-based calculation problems, are the easy button excuse for why you didn't hit the target. Well, I had, everything was great as I shot at four, five, six, seven, eight hundred. But at 900 and 1,000, I'm off. Hmm. I've heard about this transonic instability thing. Let me go check and see 
how fast the bullet's going at those ranges. Huh. Come to find out it's in transonic. Must be transonic instability. I just think not the case. that's commonly what's occurring. It's not the case. Yeah. It's not the case at all. And and in most are there bullets that have transonic instability or dynamic instability? Absolutely. Are they as common as people throw that word around about? I don't believe so. Yeah. And I I state that belief off of the radar. <clears throat> yeah, it's not yeah, you're not speculating or not anecdotal. This is you've seen twenty thousand shots worth of bullets go through that transonic and into subsonic. Uh-huh. And it's just, it just doesn't happen. Yeah. There are some designs that, that lend themselves to that, but for the most part, a modern design, long range bullet, it's just a non-issue. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That was, that's good to know. That is definitely a myth because I think everybody's heard that and you mentioned it a bunch of times, but we've all heard that. Yeah. Yep. Do you want to do wind? I think we owe it to our listeners to talk about wind deflection. If they've, made it, if they've made it this far if and not like slammed their phone on the ground. Hey, <laughs> all I have to say is I shoot quarter M away all day long if I do my part, except for the wind. <laughs> <laughs> we'll dispel yeah. that statement later. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's, that's, that's a running joke around here. Is, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I will do. say the number one reason I miss targets is other than me being an idiot, wind. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. for sure. Okay, well, so there's... wind's kind of important, right? Kind of. Um, <laughs> it's our, our highest mechanism of failure. Um, <laughs> so there's some misconceptions, and I think this one has had a pretty, got, pretty good job done as far as dispelling it, especially in like the past 10 years, but there's probably still some folks that don't understand it. I just described this at a match this weekend. So Tanner, a couple uh, times, the guy actually. that I was uh, explaining this to out, out at the match in Colorado, if you're listening, here's the, the, same, uh, the same regurgitation that I gave you there. So... Does a wind, does the wind physically push the bullet off course? Mm, maybe somewhat because there, the bullet does have surface area and the wind does have force. And when those two things interact, there's something that's going to happen yeah. there. Well, there's really only two forces, right? Push and pull. So it's got to do one or the other. But it's not the, it's not the mechanism that drives the wind deflection that you observe. Right. Okay. So that would be the true statement. Um, so what, what is happening there? It's tied directly back into what we talked about with aerodynamic jump and and spin drift when the when but to prove this to yourself uh if you're a reloader or a hand loader and you have a component bullet if you if you took a rifle and you shot a target at let's say uh you know a half second time of flight uh say 500 yards in a 10 mile an hour crosswind and you observe that you know you have let's call it three feet of wind deflection whatever the ballistics were just throwing numbers out with that bullet, <clears throat> if you simply took the, the, the bullet itself, the, the reloading or handloading component, and you dropped it so that it hit the ground exactly a half a second later in those same winds, would that, which, you know, a couple feet off the ground is what that would equate to. Yeah. Uh, more than a couple, but the internet, I'm sure, will let us know the exact number of that. Yeah. I'm not going to do it <laughs> off the top of my head. But uh, you drop that bullet in that exact same wind. Is it going to fly three feet to the left and hit the ground? No. no. Nope. No. There's no way. So the wind isn't physically pushing the bullet off course in the way that you observe it, or the deflection that it ends up having on target. So what's happening is when when the bullet encounters the crosswind, we're going to go back to the bullet is static and the the velocity it's traveling at is the oncoming airflow yeah, okay. coming over yeah, the top. Yeah, kind of, of it, flipping okay? it up here. Yeah, so so bullet is staying still, and there's three thousand foot per second airflow coming over the top of it, right, right in line with it, right, because it's traveling point forward. If a ten mile an hour crosswind hits it from this side, that's fourteen point seven feet per second. The bullet will find a call it a, a happy place in the relative wind velocity. So you have a 3,000 foot per second vector coming this way, and you have a 14.7 coming to the side. Slightly off of center of the, way it's, of the way it's traveling, pointing to the right slightly because the wind's coming from the right, the bullet will orient itself there and find kind of a state of equili- equilibrium or stability you could think of it as. Again, the nose pattern is still wobbling around. And remember, when the wind hits it, the bullet gets super unhappy. That yeah. was that 0.03, 0.5, 1.5 degree problems yep. that we so talked about. Yeah, so now the about. nose is spinning at a higher degree of yaw. Yeah, when the wind hits it, the nose gets unhappy. It wakes up. Um, but in, in the same example that we described earlier, 
because it because it orients itself to the new relative wind vector, which is to the right of center, uh, because the wind is coming from the right, it's going to spend more of its time, the nose is going to spend more of its time to the right than it is to the left. And that causes that drag differential of the bullet flying slightly sideways to where the deflection uh, of that due to the drag happens uh, to the left. Wow. So it's not that it's pushing on it. And again, I'm kind of running out of a little bit of mental steam here on the yeah the keeping the analogies uh, digestible. But so if I think the I might I might have messed up the spin drift one a touch, but no, I think the the classic example that helps outline what you said just with the bullet aligning itself is the weather vane. Yeah, uh, a weather vane. A weather vane is maybe I I typically don't use that analogy because a weather vane is pinned. Yeah, right, right. and and the bullet it's the bullet isn't yeah, yeah. yeah because it's. It's actually the fact that that nose wakes up and that it spends more time to the right than to the left that's causing it to occur. Okay. And the higher the wind speed, the more it wakes up. Bigger the, the patterning is, yep. so the, the more magnitude to the right it spends than to the left. And then the more it consequently drifts away from the wind. Mm -hmm. Deflects, yeah. Deflects, right. Yeah. So the spin drift is technically a drift and the wind is technically a deflection. Mm -hmm. Wow, that was dense. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Excellent. So do we want to, do we want to wrap this podcast up right there and maybe save, uh, save a few rounds for things that generally don't matter for almost everybody, like, you know, the, the very romanticized Coriolis effect and that kind of stuff for maybe a separate ELR type external drag different or, or podcast. Probably. Um, cause that one, that right there was a little over an hour and I mean, that was dense. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm going to have to listen to that one again. But I think our customers, you know, we've got customers all over the world that do all kinds of shooting. We've got pistol shooters and USPSA and we've got three gunners and we've got long range people. and We've got probably our biggest customers, the hunter. Um, but for those out there seeking more information, uh, that's, that's factual information and not, you know, dogma and not, you know, just myths being continually regurgitated. Uh, I feel like this was super helpful. And for that group that's hungry for that information, um, I think this was a good one and, and really w laid out nicely. And uh, I'm certainly uh, not on your level, but I can't think of anything past what we talked about that's working on the bullet between you and the target um, that needs to be talked about unless you can think of something. I think anything could probably be a separate podcast, really. We've covered quite a bit in this one yeah. you usually think of more stuff as soon as we walk as out of the soon room as, yeah, we like, oh course. shoot we should have talked about this <laughs> yeah right yeah i guess i would just say again um that there might have been a few things i misspoke on there um i haven't gone that in the weeds on on like that full yeah. gambit only verbally in a really long time that's, well, like, that's you, my fault so we, i apologize yeah for, i was gonna say i could have <laughs> slipped more. up on a few of those but i i hope I hope the intention worked in that that <clears throat> those analogies give somebody that's never heard those before a, a better level of understanding. If if it did that, then then great. If I messed up a few of the little details, which I probably did. Yeah. Well, again, I could have gave you more time to to uh, think about this and to prepare for this. But you know, these podcasts we're just kind of spring them on you guys as you have time because yeah. this is not your job and educating people is not your job, although you're really good at it. And you guys both spend a lot of time at matches and within the company and outside the company, you know, trying to educate more and more people on this stuff. Uh, it's not your job and you've got, you've got more than a full work week of stuff to do. Uh, <laughs> so I appreciate you guys coming in here, taking time away from that. And if you're not prepped on all the little details, I'm not worried about that. And I think our uh, listening base will also not hold that against you because uh, the stuff that you are giving us and I feel like a baby bird just sitting here with my mouth open like <laughs> give me more give me more uh, but uh, and also I think that the education piece is, is huge because when you have a better understanding of how things work and then you have a little bit more understanding of kind of in depth what causes a bullet to go where it does you are less apt to take the Oh, it's transonic instability. You're right. less apt to take that accuser. You're less apt to say, "Oh, I I pulled that shot. I know I pulled that shot," or or whatever. And you're more apt to say, "You know, okay, I need to 
tighten these nuts because I was loose here and I did that, but I can't hide behind, you know, saying, oh, whatever. And you can't, you can't say without a smile and a joke that you're a quarter inch shooter and you've got a <laughs> quarter inch rifle system when you do your part, you know, except for the wind or whatever, you know, that, yeah. that kind of joke. And that education I think, uh, is, is huge. And, and, you know, there's a bunch of people out there trying to get good information out there and, and, uh, you guys have the best information in my opinion, and you're really good at sharing it. So again, thank you guys for coming on. I'm looking forward to continuing this study. I know we mentioned early on in this podcast and the two before it, that we're going to get to ballistic solvers. And I think that one is going to go over really well just because that's what the, that's what people use. That's how they interact yeah. with ballistics is mm-hmm. ballistic solvers. And now having laid this groundwork, they'll have not only the understanding of the ballistic solver, but also of all of the forces that are going on from the moment that they pull the trigger. And that's, that's really rad. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks again, guys. Uh, I'll let you guys get back to it. And uh, again, I can't thank you enough. Sure. Thanks for having us on. Awesome. Guys, I hope you out there enjoyed this podcast. I know it was dense, uh, but incredibly good information. Hopefully you enjoyed it. And we'll catch you guys on the next one.